Hey there, welcome to That Dang Dad, my name is Phil, and tonight I just want to kick back, have a little fun, and I want to tell you about a piece of art that was so effective, every generation of conservatives for the last 107 years has gotten their asses chapped by it. Now, I want to set the stage a little before we get to the piece, because I am not an art historian. I didn't study it in school, and I am but a wide-eyed dilettante when it comes to artistic movements, artistic philosophy, things of that nature. Plus, I don't really have any personal affection for this piece. I'm going to be relying on outside sources to explain it and contextualize it, which I will of course cite, but I wanted to get that out there because the spark for this video is not the piece itself. Instead, I'm interested in this topic because I used to be one of the conservatives getting got by this piece in my teens and 20s. I was one of the dorks waxing hysterically about how this piece represented the destruction of artistic integrity and the total soullessness of the modern world. And what I want to talk about is the difference between me then and me now. But we'll get to that later. Supposing I haven't actually spoiled the piece in the video thumbnail, those of you with any kind of interest in art or conservative moral panics probably have a few guesses as to which piece of art I'm talking about. Could it be St. Matthew and the Angel by the art world's original foot guy, Michelangelo Caravaggio? It depicts a balding older man with no shoes hunched over a book writing on a blank page. A feminine angel huddles up against Matthew and holds the pen along with him, helping him write. As Professor Rachel Van Wylen explains, this piece was commissioned for the church of San Luigi de Francesi to commemorate St. Matthew, but when it was completed, the church and the wealthy patrons hated it. Why? Well, for one, they didn't like the implication that the angel was actually guiding St. Matthew's hand as he wrote his gospel. They preferred to think of him as a dignified, commanding presence who wrote using his own intellect. But what they really hated was his bare feet poking out at the viewer. In the world of 1600s Italy, bare feet like that would signify poverty. So this St. Matthew would be coded as a common man. Maybe even a... Poor person? Church bigwigs wanted saints to be heroic, aspirational figures, not just some schlub. Caravaggio, colossal murdering asshole that he was, was a man of the common people and he loved to schlubify important figures from the Christian Bible, giving them wrinkles or dirty feet as a way of saying that Christianity was for everyone. According to art historian Claudia Vigiani, Caravaggio's artistic ideology often functioned as a critique of elements in the Catholic culture that ignored the needs of the poor, and he was often commissioned by sympathizers in the Vatican precisely to remind people that Christ did live as a human, he arguably lived in poverty, and he definitely commanded everyone to treat the poor with respect and dignity. So no, this isn't the piece that I want to talk about. I've been a uh, Vaggio Vaccaro since the first time I ever saw one of his works in the Getty Museum. We stand chaotic bisexuals on this channel now and forever. Now, we could flash forward all the way to 1987's bombshell photograph Immersion, also known as Piss Christ, by Andres Serrano. This photo depicts a small crucifix complete with Lord and Savior submerged in, you guessed it, urine. The photo is saturated all to hell, several puns not intended, giving it this bizarre, almost alien quality with the deep red transitioning to a golden glow and tiny bubbles scattering like stardust, the whole thing looking like a dream or a vision from a distant planet or something. And yeah, as expected, Reagan era Christian conservatives were super chill and open-minded about it. Ha, <laughs> just kidding, everybody flipped the fuck out. Especially when they found out that Serrano had received $5,000 of taxpayer money from the National Endowment for the Arts. He got death threats, he lost work, the budget for the NEA got slashed, and the photograph was vandalized several times. Even being damaged beyond repair by Christian extremists in France in 2011. Who also threatened to kill museum workers for showing it. Art, baby! Interestingly, according to Serrano, he never intended the work to be seen as blasphemy. The work has been described as both a commentary on the cheap commercialization of Christian icons, as well as a serious Christian exploration of the bodily horror of the crucifixion, since it's likely Christ would have urinated and defecated during the event. Serrano has always maintained an affinity for Catholicism and an affectionate interest in Christ. But nah, this isn't the one that I want to talk about. All you art nerds out there, you know where we're going. You know what's coming. It is the great artistic thorn in the side of every conservative. The piece of art that makes them madder than they've ever been. A piece so devastating, Twitter accounts with Greek statue avatars are forced to complain about it once a week minimum. It is the one. The only.
Yeah. That's right. 1917, Marcel Duchamp, motherfucking fountain. For the benefit of the radio audience, let me describe it for you. Fountain is a type of sculpture called a ready-made, meaning a pre-built everyday object that has been selected and possibly modified by the artist, elevating it from something ordinary into an art piece worthy of engagement, not necessarily because of something intrinsic to the object, but rather because it was curated by the artist. In the case of Fountain, it is a standard white porcelain urinal laying on its back. On the bottom left, it has been signed in slightly sloppy black paint, R. Mutt, 1917. And that's it. That's the piece. Those of you who have never seen this work before, are you shocked? Are you scandalized? Are you seeing red and spitting mad? Is this the death of art? Probably not. But for a certain kind of beautiful mind, Fountain is everything from lazy to a money laundering scheme to an attack against art itself to the inevitable culmination of the death of God. When I was a conservative Christian, I used to talk about this piece all the time while holding court at the local youth group camp out or whatever. I would have told you that I was an art lover and so this piece was a desecration of the world of art. It was like a slap in the face to the artists who had toiled for years to perfect their craft and transport the viewer into a world of creativity and awe and contemplation. Sitting here now and trying to interrogate the stranger of my past self, I think more than anything, I resented Fountain for, as I saw it, trying to trick people, trying to make a fool out of them. To me, at that time, a museum or a gallery was a place where I, as a normal person, could go to have a transcendent experience. To trust the curators to immerse me in an emotional or intellectual space beyond the drudgery of everyday life, not unlike a church. An artist like Duchamp or Pollock or Rothko annoyed me, having never seen them in person, because it felt like the art world playing a joke on us normies who didn't know better and were just trying to catch a taste of something extraordinary on a Saturday afternoon. In a previous video, I've talked about how conservatives are very motivated by the fear of somebody getting a reward that they don't deserve. And a close cousin of that is a fear that they are being scammed. I think for 20-year-old Phil, there was this deep insecurity that I was the target of a scam by smirking academics who wanted to trick me away from objective truth and beauty with highfalutin college words. I had, and often still have, this deep fear that people are laughing at me for not being in on the joke. I hate feeling like I'm not in on the joke. But anyway, let's talk about Fountain. Like, what's the deal? To talk about Fountain, we have to talk about its creator, Marcel Duchamp. And to talk about old Marcel, we have to talk about the artistic culture that he was moving and grooving in. Henri Robert Marcel Duchamp was a French artist and thinker active at the beginning of the 1900s all the way through the early 1960s. He was a part of a cohort of turn-of-the-century artists like Picasso and Matisse who really started to test the boundaries of visual arts and open up revolutionary new possibilities. Duchamp was associated with Cubism for a while, but around the time of World War I, he became a major figure in what would come to be called Dada. To tell you about Dada, I'm going to be leaning heavily on an article in Smithsonian Magazine written by Paul Trachtman in 2006. But to give you what I believe is the elevator pitch, Dada is an artistic movement that arose in Europe and the United States out of revulsion towards the mechanical and scientific horrors of World War I and widespread capitalist exploitation all around the globe. For the Dadaist, if reason and logic could lead us to mustard gas, to trenches full of corpses, to child slavery in the Congo, to millions and millions and millions of innocent lives lost, then to hell with logic and reason. Why should we allow ourselves to be treated like machines built to be used up? And why would we submit ourselves to doing things the proper way when piles of the dead aren't considered improper? This may be why one of the founding figures of Dadaism, Francis Picabia, liked to create nonsense schematics for machines that couldn't exist. The industrial production of killing machines was burning Europe to the ground. A machine that couldn't function would feel like a mercy. To quote Dada OG Hans Richter, Compared with all previous isms, Dada must have seemed hopelessly anarchic. But for us, who lived through it, this was not so. On the contrary, it was something meaningful, necessary, and life-giving. The official belief in the infallibility of reason, logic, and causality seemed to us senseless. As senseless as the destruction of the world and the systematic elimination of every particle of human feeling. This was the reason why we were forced to look for something which would re-establish our humanity. 
So when Duchamp drifted from cubism into Dada, he became interested in breaking out of art that was merely what he called retinal, meaning designed to be pleasing to the eye. He wanted to create art that would engage and expand the mind. To that end, Duchamp came up with the concept of the ready-made, meaning taking an ordinary object and promoting it into art purely by choosing it. For old Marcel, this wasn't a huge radical leap because isn't paint mass-produced? Isn't the act of painting just pushing around some manufactured consumer products and arranging them? Why not push that to its absolute limit? Duchamp's first ready-made was bicycle wheel, which was a standard bicycle wheel mounted upside down onto a stool. After that came bottle rack, a bottle drying rack, and in advance of a broken arm, which was just a snow shovel. By taking something that was supposed to be aesthetically uninteresting and declaring it art, Duchamp was challenging not only the concept of what art can be, but also the notion that art should be adored. In a BBC interview, he specifically said he'd chosen a bicycle wheel that was neither beautiful nor ugly, but one that produced in him a point of indifference. This would allow the piece to function almost purely as an intellectual exercise rather than aesthetic enjoyment or displeasure. According to his friend and collaborator Hans Richter again, Duchamp declared that these ready-mades became works of art as soon as he said they were. When he chose this or that object, a coal shovel for example, it was lifted from the limbo of unregarded objects into the living world of works of art. Looking at it made it into art. Anyone who sought to extract aesthetic pleasure, something Duchamp not only did not intend, but actively eschewed, admiring perhaps the rhythm of the bottle rack or the lightness and elegance of the bicycle wheel, must surely have been unable to maintain this attitude when confronted with the urinal. And if he did maintain it, let him, was Duchamp's reaction. So here we are, back at the urinal. We have to stop meeting like this. We can now see that Fountain sits very comfortably in Duchamp's progression from cubist painter to Dadaist provocateur. And interestingly, there's one extra bit of context for Fountain specifically. In 1912, the Salon d'Independence in Paris grudgingly accepted one of Duchamp's cubist paintings for their catalog, before cajoling his brothers to convince him to withdraw it. That betrayal likely influenced his decision to submit Fountain, signed by an R. Mutt, to Duchamp's own Society of Independent Artists in 1917, just to see how open they were to challenging art made by someone that no one had ever heard of before. When it was rejected, he resigned as the society's director in protest. So we have a piece that, one, functioned as a test of open-mindedness for a fledgling indie art society, and two, functioned as an art piece meant to stimulate thinking without relying on visual interest. But I would argue that Fountain contains a third function that is central to the aims and ideology of Duchamp and his fellow Dadaists, and that's that it's fucking funny. Like, come on, just step back for a minute and think about it. It's really funny to sign your name to a urinal and then hang it up next to a Rembrandt or whatever. And when you look at some of his other ready-mades, you can see that he treats them like jokes too. Like, the title of the snow shovel is In Advance of a Broken Arm. Like, that's a joke. Or take trebuchet, which is a small rack of coat hooks. Duchamp had purchased it to use as coat hooks, but no one ever hung it up, and he kept tripping over it every time he left his studio. So he finally said fuck it and christened the piece trebuchet, which is a pun on the French word meaning to stumble over. To put it simply, Marcel Duchamp loved shitposting. Duchamp stumbled so Drill could run. And yes, I would argue that the absurd humor of Drill or the non-humor humor of Tim and Eric are direct descendants of the Dadaist movement. At the risk of explaining and thus blunting the joke, what makes Drill's Twitter output so hilarious, for me anyway, is that he adopts the overly opinionated, overly confrontational, and overly confident posture that social media encourages, but about overly specific niche topics or incomprehensible pet peeves. In an almost inversion of the ready-made, he strips away the intellectual core of posting so that a post can only be retinal, or dare I say, libidinal? This shines a light on the inherent absurdity that a lot of us, myself included, operate with when we get in character online, having pointless arguments over trivial topics or posting bizarre fables on LinkedIn or whatever. Social media has broken our brains, and Drill's broke-brained tweeting mirrors that back to us. In the same way, Tim and Eric's brand of meta or anti-comedy functions as a kind of mirror for the decay laying beneath the surface of America's culture of consumption. In a paper for Columbia University called The Dada of Haha, -Ha, Alexandra Warwick writes, To marathon a season of Tim and Eric's awesome show would be to subject oneself to dozens of incoherent sales pitches for useless products. 
to meet a fleet of alternative fact-hawking crackpots, to be subjected to the talents of the creatively bankrupt, to drown in full-tilt bureaucratic nightmare. In short, marathoning a season of Awesome Show could be a little like living in America. In our hypermodern times, American culture can itself appear incoherent for its emphasis on the hollow and the artless. Tim and Eric's work is therefore not inanity for inanity's sake, its ramming speed matches that at which we process media in our internet age. Its retro aesthetic speaks to our backwards facing pop pilfering, and its alternate America is as alienating as this one can be. And much in the same way that Drill's nonsense tweets traffic in the absurdity of the style in which we post, Tim and Eric's low quality filming style functions as a jab at a media world locked in the stranglehold of unseen, untalented executives. Warwick continues. In many of Awesome Show's bits, the joke does not stem from content as much as form. The real screwball is the fictional showrunner of their universe whose invisible hand gave the videos his stamp of approval. Ugly fades, ghastly lighting, fuzzy resolution, chintzy graphics, tracking errors, tacky wipe transitions, jerky camera movements, strange zooms, and expert slicing. The mystery of what kind of strange soul might let these slide proves as tickling as the actions on screen. So. Back to Duchamp, there is a sense in which the people upset at Fountain for being anti-art aren't wrong. In fact, Duchamp himself is credited with originating the concept of anti-art. He wanted to act as a slap in the face to the art world. He wanted to disrespect what was respected and violate what was acceptable. And while I obviously can't know his mind, to me that slap in the face wasn't violence meant to wound, but rather the concerned slaps that you might use to wake somebody up who was tired or drunk. Back to Hans Richter, he recalls, The professor said that a Cezanne or a Picasso or any work of art could be seen again and again and yet afford new sensations, new emotions, new matter for meditation. The work of art is not exhausted by being looked at many times. On the contrary, it gains in the process. This is not true of the coal shovel, the bicycle wheel, the urinal. They were not intended by Duchamp to stimulate meditation or artistic emotions. They were intended to shock, to tear the beholder away from the stagnant meaninglessness of his habitual attitude towards art, his conventional artistic experience. Such a shock is not repeatable. If you truly hated the concept of art, you wouldn't care about tearing somebody away from their habitual attitude towards it. Their thoughtless consumption wouldn't sting. So in my mind, as much as Duchamp may have claimed to want to destroy art, his slaps to the face feel like tough love. But that's not the reason I made this video. If you recall back before the urinals and the piss jars and the foot guys, I said that I wanted to examine the difference between the conservative Christian version of me that hated Fountain and the svelte Antifa super soldier that you see here before you today. And that difference is not that I now like Fountain. I mean, look behind me, my wall is covered in Edward Hopper prints. Ready-mades don't do anything for me at a personal aesthetic level. No, the difference I want to talk about is this. 20-year-old me didn't make this video, and 41-year-old me did. To put it another way, 20-year-old me never actually bothered to learn about Fountain, Duchamp, Dadaism, or any of that. 20-year-old me wasn't curious about the perspectives of people I didn't know or didn't like, and I happily treated those people and their passions as disposable. Whereas, when 41-year-old me saw the latest performative anti-fountain outburst from whichever interchangeable right-wing dipshit it was, after laughing at them, I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder why Duchamp made fountain. I should look that up. I'm not going to attempt to universalize my experience into a conservatives drive like this and liberals drive like that kind of thing, but reflecting on this script made me think about the fact that for as comparatively well-educated and well-read as I was as a teen, my most deeply held conservative viewpoints came from a place of deep incuriosity. I thought my ideological opponents were lazy welfare queens and sexual deviants trying to undermine the social order. They wanted the world to reward bad choices. They wanted everything easy. They wanted all the rights and none of the responsibilities. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I started to meet these people out in the real world and I discovered that they weren't the one-dimensional monsters I thought they were. They actually had well-rounded personalities and they actually knew things I didn't. And they had seemingly logical reasons for the things that they were doing and saying. It was a long process, but Bit by bit, new friend by new friend, I started to get a lot more interested in people. Like, why they did things, why they thought things, and what they knew that I didn't. I began to suspect that my knee-jerk reaction to ideas unfamiliar to me might 
not always be the most trustworthy. Flash forward to my mid to late 30s and I started to hear this term flying around, prison abolition. And I could feel Mr. Incuriosity jump right up and start shouting, oh really? Just gonna get rid of prisons? And release all the murderers and child predators? You really wanna live in a Mad Max hellscape? But by then, Mr. Incuriosity wasn't alone. Ms. Inquisitive was part of me now. And Ms. Inquisitive heard all that ruckus and she said, yeah, wow, I've never heard of prison abolition before. How could someone support that? Let's see if we can find out the thought process. I bet that would be interesting. And it was interesting. It exposed me to ideas that I'd never encountered, but ideas that started to make a lot of sense. Maybe it wasn't such a crazy idea after all. Anyway, to bring this thing home, I'm not saying that you are morally obligated to appreciate Duchamp or Picasso or Tim and Eric or prison abolition. Chase your bliss, like what you like, may a thousand flowers bloom. What I am saying is that I was leading a diminished, narrow-minded life when I let my incuriosity dictate my engagement with ideas outside my comfort zone. Being curious doesn't mean that you have to like or even accept explanations for things that seem strange or offensive to you. What it does mean is acknowledging that the people around you, by and large, operate in a context where, to them, their decisions are logical or rational or reasonable or inevitable. It doesn't make those decisions right or good necessarily, but you might be surprised at how compelling their rationale is. And maybe that rationale redeems those choices in your mind. Maybe you'll develop a new appreciation for things that previously annoyed you. Or even if you don't, you at least have a better idea for the environment and systemic conditions that led to those things, and perhaps a better game plan for addressing those conditions. Anyway, so, have you ever reacted negatively to an artwork and then come around on it later? Or have you ever followed a thread of curiosity that recontextualized someone's behavior for you and helped you understand them better? Let us know down in the comments. Anyway, thank you for joining me tonight. Hope this was a nice breezy topic and a relief from some of the heavier things happening around the world right now. If you found it delightful, please give it a like. Please subscribe if you haven't. And please share this video with somebody that you think might get a kick out of it. And hey, thanks for sticking around during all that year-end talk. You really put the P in MVP. Good night!